home. No, I am. So here I am in my home. So actually, okay, okay. okay. Uh, he, he got COVID actually. <laughs> oh. <laughs> yeah, he, Okay. Three days, I think, uh, three days or four days back, it was. You tested. Are we safe? I think he has gone offline or. Yeah, we, we, we are probably connection problem. Yeah, there's some connection issue. Yeah, he's back. He's back. Yeah. Abhi say, can you hear? Me? Yeah, now I can hear you. I think uh, somehow I got log out. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah. So, so when you tested uh, uh, for positive? Uh, four days ago. Four days. So, Four or five had so actually I went for testing on 26th January and okay. by that night uh, I got my report so that okay. was positive <laughs> so but you must so be feeling you normal in IA or you contacted it in your house in your oh, house. actually I don't know I took a lot of uh, precaution. I mean, this is in my usual habit, but somehow I don't know. Even I'm not sure from where I got it. So <laughs> still, I don't know from where. So, so why did you know. test? I mean, were you in some discomfort or something? or something? Yeah, actually I was feeling fever and cold and uh -huh. uh, uh, there was some, I mean, I was feeling fever uh, that uh, to that, I mean, uh, I was feeling comfortable, uncomfortable also. So I thought the less first go for test and be sure if uh, this is normal cold or I mean, what's Corona? But I think uh, that is Corona came positive. Mm. Take care. Generally yes. mild uh, this version, but for some people it is creating some trouble. So yes, in my case, it is fine till now. Yeah, so, take a lot of chicken and mutton if you want. <laughs> yeah, that day when I was feeling cold, so I took chicken and I thought uh, I will be fine by next morning. But uh, still fever was there and then I decided to go for testing. <laughs> yeah, take care. Okay, thank you, sir. Okay, so okay, uh, so <coughs> we, we, shall, we shall start now. So, okay, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, today, we are happy to have Dr. Avishek uh, Paswan as our speaker. And most of you uh, know him. Uh, he did his uh, PhD from Aries. And after completing his PhD, he spent about uh, uh, three years uh, as a postdoc at Ayuka Pune. And recently, he moved to uh, IIA Bengaluru uh, for his uh, another postdoc. So um, Avisek is an expert in high redshift star burst galaxies. And uh, he will talk about uh, this today. So Avisek, uh, you can start now. Uh, you will have 45 minutes and I will remind you five minutes before. So okay. yeah, welcome. Okay, thank you Subendu for the introduction. Uh, Okay, so let me first uh, share yeah. my screen. I think it's, it is disabled. I'm not able to share. So. Can you check now? Yes, now I'm able to share. Okay. So can you see my screen, right? Yes, yes. Okay, so first of all, uh, I would like to thank Aries for giving me this opportunity to present my work here. And also I'd like to thank Suvendu and others who are involved in arranging my talk. So today I'll be talking about uh, properties of high receive Star Wars galaxy and their local analog, uh, which have played their contributing role to the realization of our early universe. 
So here you can see, uh, I'm going to talk about the properties of galaxies, but uh, this property is a very broad topic and it's not possible for me to cover all the properties of galaxy in a single talk. So I will talk about uh, mainly the properties of uh, galaxy related to leakage of photons, where these photons can be Lyman continuum or Lyman alpha photons. Where Lyman continuum photon means uh, the photons below the Lyman limit, that is 912 angstrom, and the Lyman alpha photon, that means this is a first uh, transition line of the Lyman series of the hydrogen atoms. So this is sort of my uh, plan of talk. So I will start first uh, discussing the importance and role of leaking properties of galaxy at far and nearby universe. And then I will come to the point where I will discuss about the our current observational understanding uh, related to the leakage property of this galaxy and what is issue with it. I mean, people have understood now. And then I will come to my work, how I have made my own efforts to address this issue. And then finally, I will summarize uh, my talk at the end. So let's begin with uh, here a very brief introduction. So this is the complete picture of our universe. It, it, it uh, starts from Big Bang to the present day. So at the Big Bang time, when the universe was completely ionized, after some time, it started uh, re, uh, becoming neutral through recombination. And it becomes a completely neutral hydrogen in forms of uh, hydrogen only. And this era here, this era of the universe is called a dark age because this uh, is a completely neutral hydrogen and there was no optical light to see anything. That's why this era is dark. And after that, out of this neutral hydrogen, the somehow first star formed and then consequently first galaxy and Asian and so on. So when these sources started forming at that time, then the emission from these sources again uh, started reionizing the neutral hydrogen. And that's why this era is called epoch of reionization. And this happened before redshift six. After that, the era is called post reionization that is at a shift uh, lower than six. And by this era, neutral hydrogen was completely ionized and the source which formed in this era, they kept, uh, uh, they kept uh, uh, evolving and they evolved into bigger structure like uh, spiral galaxy, elliptical and lenticular galaxy that we see today. So uh, my interest of this talk is here to understand the process, how this reionization happened. So till now the people believe, believe that the source sources responsible for this uh, reionization may be population third star or starburst galaxy or AGR or ejective particles. But the observational evidences about uh, population third star and ejective particles are still not uh, seen in the literature. So mainly till now the people believe that the competitive source responsible for cosmic reionization uh, is our starburst galaxy or active galaxy nuclei, but still the contribution from AGN is debated. So people now believe that this starburst galaxy may be the primary source for reionization at epoch of reionization. So now the point is that how this starburst galaxy can reionize. Because if you see the galaxy at lower, lower shift universe, which are bigger, like in forms in form of a spiral or elliptical galaxy, they contain ISM. And although they uh, form stars and they emit UV ionizing photons, but they cannot leak out their uh, UV photons because ISM will interact with their uh, produced ionizing photon. And below the Lyman limit, uh, photon with uh, having energy below the Lyman limit, that will be absorbed by dust and then re emit in the, they will be re emitted in the uh, infrared at a higher wavelength. It means that uh, galaxy contain ISM and that is not easy to leak out for one uh, UV photons. But somehow it happened at the epoch of reionization. 
So there is something that we have to understood, which is uh, very difficult. So if you see, this is another difficult part is the IGM between the distance source and the observer. Because once if galaxy somehow leak their energy photons, so it should be come, it should come through uh, IGM to us. But IGM will uh, uh, make the difficulty for traveling this UV photon at higher speed. But in literature, people have detected observationally many laminal continuum emitters at rate shift between 2.5 to 3.5. And even uh, detection of laminal alpha emitters are made at rate shift 4 to 7. It means that there is some line of sight uh, through which these photons can travel to us. Or, uh, of course, this is very difficult. It's not so much uh, straightforward procedure. So it would be best to see their local analog at low rate shift. So I will come to uh, this point one by one. First, I will start with the discussing high detection of high receive galaxy as a lemon continuum meter, and then I will come to uh, local analog. So here uh, I will start with uh, discussing the first uh, high receive lemon continuum meter. So this detection is made using the astrosat uh, UV data and. Uh, 3DHST survey data, which is a slitless geyser spectroscopy survey done using Hubble Space Telescope. So the source that I'm going to discuss, uh, this is in Hubble Deep Field, and uh, we call it AUDF01, which stands for Alt set Ultra Deep Field. And one is because this is the first object in our survey. So here, this is the picture of that galaxy which is a color composite image. And this source is selected uh, based on the highest H alpha emission and highest O3 emission flux. So here we, in the right panel, you can see there are all galaxy which are in rate 1.1 to 1.5. And this is in uh, Hubble deep field where the good south is the one part of this Hubble deep field. So this source, we selected so that uh, its red shift can allow us to see the Lyman continuum photon and it has highest H alpha and O3 emission. And also this galaxy is a low mass galaxy. So based on this selection criteria, this galaxy is selected. And this is the picture of uh, this high receive galaxy that I'm going to discuss. So you can see this galaxy is a clumpy dwarf system. And uh, this blue color shows that this is this must be established with a huge uh, ionizing photons. So first, we confirm the red shift of this source using uh, this uh, 3D uh, 3DHST spectroscopy data. The right hand top panel shows the 2D spectrum taken from the 3DHST survey, and you can see this is the O3 emission from this source, and this is the H alpha plus N2. So this 3D HST is basically low resolution spectrum. So we cannot uh, resolve this N2 emission from the H alpha line. So we have taken both in H, H alpha plus N2. So with this emission line, we confirm that this galaxy is at red shift 1.42. And here is the observed image of a few, uh, uh, this galaxy in a few filter. Uh, here. So this is detected at a SNR of three and the magnitude is estimated to be 25.8. So now the given fact that this galaxy at rate 1.42 is detected in the FUV filter of uh, S2 set. So if you see the filter response curve of the S2 set, it means that galaxy at rate is detected with its, its extreme UV photon at 600 angstrom. It means that this galaxy is leaking its extreme UV photon. But this galaxy has shipped 1.42. So how is it possible? I mean, so then we have done this IGM solution to see if the IGM is trans, uh, transparent to this uh, galaxy 
for the, this wavelength 600 or 900 mm strom. So from this plot, you can see that in both cases for a galaxy at redshift 1.4, at both wavelengths 609 angstrom, more than 80 percent of line of sight have the transmission above 80 percent. So that's why probably we got this detection of a steam UV photon from galaxy at test with 1.42. So now the point is that we have to confirm that if there is an ionizing photon, is this due to an energy activity or star formation activity in this galaxy? So here in the right hand side, we have plotted this uh, BPT diagram and it is used, it can be used as a tool for identifying Aegean or star forming galaxy based on the uh, either side of the demarcation line, which is shown in the blue and green and yellow line. So you can see that this is the point from our galaxy and this uh, line ratio shows that it falls in the star forming region. It means and also we search for the X-ray data for this galaxy in uh, archival survey. And uh, we could not see any em extra emission from this galaxy. So in both cases from this BPT diagram and non-detection in X-ray, it confirms that uh, this galaxy is pure star forming galaxy. And hence this is a star burst ligand continuum meter at redshift 1.42. Further here, uh, this is the overall view on this uh, ADF01 source. So from all the derived parameter are here. And from this, we can say that this is a low mass galaxy having stellar mass of 1.45 into 10 power 9 solar mass, having low extension around 0.15 and having low metallicity in terms of 12 plus log O by H, which is 7.99. And it has extreme uh, O3 equivalent width that is around 1500 angstrom. And also, it has a high O3 by O2 ratio, which is a proxy of uh, indicating high ionization parameter. And uh, it has a SFR around 55 solar mass per year. And it is mostly dominated by young stellar population having age of four to six million years. So if you see the properties of all these parameters, this is a typical property of one Lyman continuum emitter at any red shift. And these derived parameters are also consistent with other Lyman continuum emitter, which are studied in the literature. So from this source, uh, we measure the scale fraction, which is greater than 20%. And uh, so this- Abhishek, yes. uh, so I have a qu uh, question. So if you go back to this BPT diagram, mm -hmm. uh, this H beta emission line was visible in the uh, uh, spectrum because the spectrum you showed, there was no H beta. I mean, oh, there was, is there an H beta? Because the yeah, noise, yeah. noise so is large. Yeah, we took the limit noise because here is, is, H beta is supposed to be here, okay. but it, it is within noise, so we took the limit. And uh, I mean, we first estimated the H alpha flux, uh -huh. and we did this extension from other parameter like ACD and uh, UV beta slope using mm -hmm. the UV data. Mm -hmm. And then uh, we just from this here, we just put the limit to so incorporate in our ACD model. So it's a three sigma noise or three sigma noise. Okay, okay, okay. Go ahead. Okay, thank you. So this uh, result was very important in two sense. First, first is that we detected the first uh, Lyman continuum leaker, which is emitting its extreme UV photon at 600 angstrom. And the second, this is the first source which is discovered as a Lyman continuum emitter in the redshift gap of 0.25 to 2.5. So you can see these are the uh, previous high receipt uh, Lyman con confirmed Lyman continuum emitter and their Lyman photon is detected above 80, 850 or around mean wavelength of 900 angstrom. And similarly, in case of other low receipt uh, continuum emitter, still it is uh, around 850 to 900 angstrom. 
and there were no other source before this work in this uh, redshift gap. So that's why this uh, work was very important. And also it's not only important in the sense of these two points, but we have now several sources detected from UVIT and those results will be come very soon. And uh, we have got many uh, UV uh, Lyman continuum emitter, uh, which emitting their extreme UV photon. So if we have many sources having uh, this uh, extreme UV photon, they can provide good data point in the extreme UV spectrum so that the stellar model can be modified accordingly and they can people can improve the uh, SED models for extreme UV part of the spectrum. So this work is also important in the sense that just to get the more number of uh, Lyman continuum meter having extreme UV photons. So this local counterpart uh, of this high receive galaxy, they are nothing but they are green pea galaxy. So now I will discuss the local analog of this high shift Lyman continuum or Lyman alpha emitter, and they are known as green peas. And this green pea galaxy was first introduced by the Cardman et al. in 2009, and they lie in the receive range of 0.1 to 0.36. And their further local counterparts, they are known as Blueberry Galaxy, and it was first introduced by Young et al. in 2017. And they lie in the receive range of 0.02 to 0.05. Why they are called as a green pea or blueberry galaxy? Because if you look at their visual appearance, it looks like green peas or blueberries. So that's why they are called as blueberry and green pea. And the physical reason behind this is their extreme O3 emission line. So if you see their optical spectrum and uh, their O3 emission line, so depending on the redshift for the blue, uh, green pea galaxy, their O3 emission will lie in the SDSS uh, R band. And in case of uh, this uh, blueberry galaxy, its uh, O3 emission line will fall in SDSS uh, G band. So that's why their color is green and blue. Sorry. So, so, so some of this blueberry and green pea galaxy has uh, already been identified as Lyman continuum leaker that uh, they are present here in this uh, plot. So they are known as the best local analog for those high receive galaxy, which are confirmed as Lyman continuum leaker at epoch of, uh, I mean, high receive. Uh, still, there are very few galaxy which are detected uh, above the receive six. But if you see the initial line properties of this galaxy, so they are very much similar to the high receive galaxy, even at high receive uh, above six. So this comparison was done by the recent work uh, of uh, Izuto et al. And they have nicely shown that comparison, how the emission line property of this galaxy is similar to high receive galaxy. So being in local universe, uh, we have good chance to observe these sources easily. We can study these sources in detail. That's why they are interesting. And they are the local laboratory for understanding the properties of high receive galaxy. So here, if we, taking the advantage of this uh, local uh, high receive galaxy, uh, people have tried to see many correlation if how they can correlate if uh, there are many uh, emission line property or physical property of this galaxy with the escape fraction of Lyman continuum photon or Lyman alpha photon. So on the left side, if you see, uh, there's a correlation between V separation and Lyman continuum escape fraction. And where the V separation is the velocity separation between two peaks of Lyman alpha profile. So here one can see that as the velocity separation increases, the escape fraction is decreased. Similarly, uh, in optical band, people have found that the V separation of Mg to doublet line is also correlated with the escape fraction of Lyman alpha photons. And uh, although these samples are not uh, large, but uh, there is a correlation people have reported till now because uh, there were no uh, so much uh, uh, advancement in, in previous uh, five years, 
now people are crazy to collect all this number of uh, lemon containing or lemon on five meters. So these are based on the previous study. So of course, sample is small, but now it is getting enhanced and, and enhanced. So this is the correlation, but still we can see based on the small, there is some correlation uh, showing this separation and uh, the escape fraction of lemon continuum, lemon per photon. So with this, people are just trying to see if there is any indirect indicator, which can be used as a lemon uh, continuum escape fraction predictor, because uh, this observation of Lyman continuum photon in case of a low receive galaxy is not easy. We have to go for HST observation using COS instrument. So again, people uh, try to understand this with uh, optical O3 by O2 ratio line, line ratio. So this is also showing a uh, good correlation and this is easy to observe O3 by O2 ratio. So that's why uh, this is broadly used to identify Lyman continuum leak, leaking candidate in low receipt inverse, and even it is used for high receipt uh, galaxy also. But uh, there are few problems with uh, all these uh, understanding because in the recent work by Kaj et al. in 2020, he found that in his simulated uh, receipt galaxy, uh, there are few sources which have a O3 by O2 ratio very high, but their uh, escape fraction of the Lyman continuum photon is small. Also, these some sources are also uh, observe, uh, are found in observation. And also there are few sources which, which uh, O3 by O2 ratio is small, but uh, there is a high escape fraction. So there is a discrepancy overall we can say. And also apart from this, Although this GNP galaxy and blueberry galaxy, which are now understood as the local counterpart of these high receive Lyman continuum emitter, they are not resolved in SDSS or SDSS like survey. So we don't know the host properties, if it, how the host uh, looks like in this case of uh, sources. So through my work, I tried to uh, Address these points, and uh, for this, uh, I did one study of blueberry galaxy, which is observed in the Manga survey. And this galaxy is shown here in color composite image. And this is a dwarf system, and uh, this is classified as blueberry based on the color color diagram and its emission line properties here. So this is the color boundary defined for selecting the blueberry source and the blue dot, which is showing the previous identified blueberry sources from this young et al. And our blueberry source I defined here within this red circle. And this is the host of the galaxy, which is extended. And uh, so these are the color from the blueberry and the host galaxy. In all, each case, we can see that this galaxy is classified as a blueberry source. And also within this circle, red circle, we can see the emission ratio of O3 by O2 line is very high. It's uh, all above 10. So this is the typical property of uh, one blueberry galaxy. So this galaxy is identified as blueberry. And interesting part is that this galaxy was already observed by COS instrument on onboard HST. And uh, this JESCOT work confirmed that this galaxy is Lyman or 5 meter which uh, escape fraction is around 10% and Lyman continuum escape fraction around 3%. And this is also a low mass galaxy having high SFR, low metal core galaxy with high O3 by O2 ratio, extreme O3 equilibrium width. This is again similar to the our high receive galaxy. You can see the uh, characteristic parameter of all these uh, galaxy. So we, when I put this galaxy in this discrepancy plot, you can see, although um, our blueberry galaxy has O3 by O2 ratio around 15, it has a less escape, continuous escape fraction. So this is lying here, over here. So this is one example of this discrepancy, but now we have uh, this uh, IFU data for this galaxy. So we can go into detail and see 
what is the ISM structure in this galaxy, making this galaxy as less, less uh, uh, Lyman continuum matter, although it's uh, OT by 2 ratio is high. So we try to understand this uh, using a new diagnostic uh, for understanding the leakage property of galaxy, which is called as S2 deficiency parameter. And the S2 deficiency can be defined based on this plot, which is shown in the left side. And uh, this is a plot between S2 by H alpha and O3 by H beta line ratio. And this here contour shows the distribution of all the normal star forming galaxy in SDSS, and this black dotted line shows the uh, mean density of this uh, contour of the star forming galaxy. And on this, we define the S2 deficiency at the horizontal distance of the galaxy from this uh, dotted uh, reference line. So in case of leaky galaxy, which is conformed as Lyman continuum meter, they are far from this uh, reference line or they are outside the uh, this uh, contour for a star forming galaxy and all those non leaky galaxy uh, which are normal star forming galaxy they lie either close to this reference line or inside the contour so this is uh, one other another parameter similar to o3 by o2 ratio which can tell you how uh, which can help us in identifying the lyman continuum emitter or candidate so how this work we can understand by this cartoon diagram. So in, so in case of ionization bounded system, where if we have a massive star formation here, so ionizing photon can create a, a strong gain sphere. And if there is a thin H1 layer, so the and the, the strong gain sphere of the ionizing photon from the star is not able to go and ionize the other layer of the had, had neutral hydrogen. So such kind of system is uh, said as uh, ionization bonded system. And it, it doesn't allow Lyman continuum photon from stars to leak out because the H1 layer will block it. In case of density bounded region, so this thin layer of H1 will be absent and it will there will be complete ionized hydrogen and in this case, this Lyman continuum photon can leak easily. So similarly, this system can be traced using here uh, S2 emission, production of S2 emission. So you can see this picture and the, the below one is saying the same thing, but there is a, a, a production of S2 emission in between the thin layer of neutral hydrogen and ionized front. And this is because this ionized front, which is warm, it cannot ionize the complete hydrogen further, but it can produce S2 emission because the uh, ionization potential for this S2 emission is less than 13.4 electron volt, which is around 10.4. So warm ionized medium is able to uh, this ionize the uh, S2 emission. So in case of, if there is galaxy, which uh, is, uh, producing huge amount of ionizing photon, but it's uh, covered by thin layer of H1, we will get the enhancement in the S2 emission, and this galaxy will fall either close to this dot line or inside the uh, contour. But in case of uh, S2 deficient galaxy, we will see some there is some hole or there is a porous distribution of uh, this ionization bounded structure, ISM structure and there will be some path to leak out the Lyman continuum photon. In this case, you will see less S2 deficient and high uh, escape of fraction of uh, Lyman continuum photon. So this principle works on this diagram. I mean, I mean to show this kind of uh, ISM structure. So now we have uh, IFU data, so we can create such map. So here is the map of S2 by H alpha emission line ratio for our blueberry galaxy. And you can see this high ratio is showing that there's an enhancement of S2 emission. And in case of blueberry source inside the red circle, there is a relatively small S2 enhancement, or you can say deficiency in S2 emission. And we confirm this S2 deficiency when we put this spectrally from inside the circle, 
onto this diagram. So you see the S pixel from this inside circle is shown by the blue dot and the S pixels outside this circle is shown by the green dot. So green dots almost falling in the within the contour or close to the reference line while the this spectrum from the blueberry region is far from the uh, reference line or outside the uh, contour it means that uh, they are relatively s2 deficient and the, this could be the potential site for uh, emitting lemon continuum photons or lemon alpha photons and the red circle here shown as is shown for the cos aperture uh, so COS has uh, observed this UV spectrum in this aperture. So, so this is good. I mean, they have selected the exact potential site for uh, leaking galaxy, uh, leaking region. And, but still we get a less escape fraction. So here we can explain this less fraction by with the help of these two other plots in the lower panel. So see, this uh, aperture is, has covered the huge uh, uh, established region, which is emitted by, which is uh, indicated by the huge amount of H alpha emission. But at the same time, so this is the basically potential site for huge production of Lyman alpha photon or Lyman continuum photon. But the same site is also dominated by the dust. So dust is the basically uh, main problem for this. Uh, uh, Lyman continuum photon or Lyman alpha photon because they will destroy these photons or they will observe or they will lose the history of these uh, photons. So, but here the aperture is uh, covering both, I mean, low with low extension and high extension. So, there it means that there is a dust uh, distribution which is in uh, porous form and uh, somehow only the small number of uh, photons they manage to leak out. So this can be explained uh, by this uh, analogy using the IS, by looking at the ISM structure in the grass. So this result also tells that how the IF field uh, observation is powerful to study this kind of uh, uh, leaker and to understand better uh, where I should put my uh, UV aperture to observe for getting a maximum escape fraction. So this can also, so we can make some plan, something like this before going for UV observation. Uh, so, uh, Abhishek, uh, so yes. do, you, do you use also N2 based VPT diagram or O2 based diagram to classify or study these objects or? No, no. Uh, so this. This is based on H2 deficiency. So we should look at only sulfur line. This yes. is not uh, about the BPT line. I mean, if you put it in the end to waste BPT diagram, do you see any difference uh, of uh, these objects separated out or something? Uh, I haven't checked, but uh, my point is that uh, that would not help in the sense that uh, because here we are dealing with the distribution of neutral hydrogen and uh, it interaction with the ionizing photon. So if there is a something which can ionize or not ionize the hydrogen, that we should look at. Mm -hmm. So S2 is the that element whose ionization potential energy 10.4, very close to the ionization potential of hydrogen. Okay. So that is the advantage of this uh, diagnostic. Okay. Yeah. So, so looking at uh, all these diagnostic uh, and the, uh, the power of this diagnostic, uh, then I tried to see if this uh, S2 deficiency can be another indicator for escape fraction. So we, then we try to see the correlation between S2 deficiency and uh, Lyman continuum escape fraction. And uh, I got very nice correlation uh, using a large number of uh, green pea and blueberry galaxy, which are already confirmed as Lyman continuum emitter. And uh, also then I checked if there is any dependency of this correlation on mass, stellar mass of the galaxy or metallicity. So you can see mass is uh, randomly distributed. There's no any pattern 
But in case of uh, metallicity, we can see there is a trend where this uh, metal poor galaxy is more uh, S2 deficient and also uh, this there is a high scale fraction. So overall, the point is that metal poor, more S2 deficient galaxy are literally more leaky. So S2 deficiency can be used a better indicator than O3 by O2 ratio. So this is the uh, message from this result. So now I will come to the second issue, which is related to the host properties of galaxy. So in our case, we can see, we can now resolve this galaxy uh, in case of both uh, blueberry and the, the extended disk emission. So we did the Galfit model modeling uh, using SDSS I band image. Why we choose SDSS I band image? Because for the given redshift of the galaxy, we can ignore all the emission line contribution in the broadband filter. So just to minimize the emission from the strong optical emission, we choose the SDSS I band image and then we did Galfit modeling. And this leads to the fit of a low sided LSP disk having a central surface brightness of 22 mag per hour second and the scale length of 1.54 kpc. So now point is that why we could detect in this galaxy but not in other blueberry galaxy or gimpy galaxy. So here is the explanation. Uh, if you see this plot, this is called main sequence uh, relation for blueberry and gimpy galaxy. So green pea galaxy are presented here in green point and blueberries are in blue point. So, and this is the star is our galaxy in this study. So, although this is blueberry galaxy at low redshift, at redshift 0.047, and these are at redshift 0.0, maximum below the 0.05. So they are but low mass. If you see, they are low mass. And here in case of green peas, they are massive, but they are at high redshift. So if there is a low LSB disk, if there is an LSB disk exist in both cases, so there will be, a, uh, this will be below the sensitivity limit of SDSS, SDSS or SDSS like survey. So, but in our case, this is similar to mass of a green pea galaxy and also at lower redshift. That's why we could detect this uh, low surface brightness uh, disk here. So here we are evidencing the most massive blueberry at low receipt. And that's why we could get this detection of uh, surface brightness, low surface brightness disk. So this is the first galaxy, blueberry galaxy, where we could see the host. And that's why we can uh, go into detail. So now this hypothesis I checked. What would be the case if I put my galaxy at higher and higher redshift? So here uh, there's a small experiment. So we model our galaxy and uh, which is at redshift 0.0472. And you can see both the blueberry region and also the extended low surface brightness disk. But when I'm putting this galaxy at higher and higher redshift, you can see the disk is started disappearing and even at high receipt, you will be unable to resolve with this uh, SDSS beam size, which is around 1.2 accepted. It means that green pea galaxy and the blueberry galaxy, they both may have this uh, low level of uh, low surface brightness of disk, but we cannot see using the SDSS, SDSS like survey. We need very bigger telescope or we need some uh, space-based observation to see this kind of uh, host structure. And when, uh, then I compared the structural properties of this green pea and blueberry galaxy with local normal uh, graph galaxy. And you can see, uh, these are the green peas which are shown in cross. And this is the blueberry galaxy from my study. So, they are all consistent with the structural property of local dwarf galaxy in both in case of scale length and the sur central surface brightness. So it means that one of the things that they are at brighter end of the local uh, normal star forming galaxy. It means that uh, this blueberry and gimpy galaxy are nothing but they are local luminous counterpart of uh, BCD galaxy. And if we know that this BCD galaxy 
see they have broad staff formation history they host old list uh, population and uh, also they show this kind of uh, structure uh, parameters so we also try to see if there we can detect old list of population in blueberry galaxies so here uh, what we did for this we stack the spectrum of blueberry galaxy within this circle and uh, for ex extended this region we stack all the spectrum uh, from the standard disk and here we can see there is a absorption feature at uh, mg1 line in both cases and we did because we could not see this feature in a single spectrum and also this galaxy was absorbed in SDSS uh, fiber slit and you can see the spectrum. There is a hardly we can see any detection of MG1 line. That is below three sigma. It means that the old stellar population is also present here, but they are very faint. And one can see only if there is a deep observation, a spectroscopy observation. So this again showing that uh, blueberry galaxy is compatible with the property of local blue dwarf galaxy or local irregular dwarf system. Then further over this stacked spectrum, we did the PPS50, which uh, shows uh, the which is used for estimating the age of stellar population. So in this, we could notice that there is a preferred feature only from the blueberry region here. And uh, there's no preferred feature from the extended disk region. See, the presence of this preferred feature, again, uh, signified that this galaxy has, uh, the established age of this blueberry region is less than 10 million years. And uh, the red fitting, uh, PPS fitting, gives the age of old stellar population around five and seven giga year in two cases. So this is again uh, similar to uh, population of a normal dwarf galaxy. And also having this IFU data, we further show the first stellar and gas kinematics for this uh, our, uh, blueberry source. And here one can see that uh, the kinematics, the upper panel shows the kinematics for gas, which is derived using HL5 emission line. And the lower panel shows the uh, stellar kinematics and which is derived using mg1 line so uh, this is the dispersion and this is the v over sigma map so in case of gas you can see the v over sigma is less than one it means that uh, this is mostly dominated by dispersion and uh, if there is rotation that would be very mild and but in case of uh, stellar kinematics so let me clarify a uh, thing here that uh, this spec cells is five cross five beginning of the normal spec cells because the MG1 absorption line was so faint, we could not detect in a single spec cell. So to detect this absorption feature, we did this five plus five first beginning, and then we fit the uh, Gaussian profile to estimate the stellar velocity or dispersion. So in both, so after this, we get, we can get, uh, V over sigma value over uh, around one and above one. It means that this uh, stellar kinematics is rotationally supported. And uh, also this is the, this line, solid line in both cases. So the kinematic axis of this object. And both case, if you see, this is misaligned in case of gas and uh, stellar disk. And this usually is it happen when the galaxy uh, galaxy go through the accretion of uh, external gas because there will be different angular momentum and the settling of the gas will be in different place and that that's why we see a misalignment between the stellar disk and gas gaseous disk so it means that the most likely this galaxy has uh, gone through the major starburst event through gas accretion so this is the so overall, the picture on the, this blueberry galaxy may be that they are normal dwarf galaxy system, but they have gone through the very massive starburst event through gas creation. And that's why these events make them as a special object similar to the high galaxy. And that's all.
So here is the summary. So in this talk, I presented one galaxy, which is known as area of, one, area of zero one, uh, which is the first Lyman continuum emitter in the shift gap 1, 2 to 2.5. And it is also seen at uh, extreme UV photon. And the IGM is the one which is playing role for this highest shift galaxy to, um, to detect. And uh, the in our Blueberry and GP study, uh, we found that they are compatible with the normal dwarf galaxy system. And uh, for further study of this blueberry and green pea galaxy, we need deep observation with a good instrument so that we can go into more detail. And also the this is the first stellar kinematic, but uh, we need further more observation to understand this property that if the gas secretion only the uh, process which uh, makes this galaxy as a special like green pea and blueberry or there are other mechanism. And uh, yeah, so this especially is all, I feel uh, observation is also very important. And still there are very less. This is the only one galaxy observed in manga, but uh, this would be good to have a uh, few observation of more sources. Yeah, so thank you, I'll stop here. Okay, let's uh, thank Avishek for this wonderful presentation. Um, so if there are any questions, comments to Avishek, please, re please raise your hand or ask the questions. Yes, Abhishek, uh, <clears throat> yeah, Vijesh here. So uh, yeah, very nice uh, uh, talk and results uh, uh, rather. So how do you separate out this uh, kinematics, uh, both stellar and gas, uh, uh, from the same uh, galaxy, I mean, the dispersion information uh, you are uh, expecting. So how mm -hmm. is it possible? Uh, are you identifying the features or uh, are they close no, so, enough? Yeah. So actually thing is that this is done using the spectrum. So emission lines that is coming from the ionized gas and the stellar kinematics is derived using uh, absorption feature, which is coming from the stars. In the same spectrum, from the same okay. spectrum, we can have velocity for gas and stars separately. Okay, okay, okay. So uh, you mean the even if they are the same line of sight, they they are representing different kinematics, right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So most in most of cases, you will find that the gas is followed by stars motion. But uh, if there is a uh, external gas equation because they fall with different angular momentum, so they can okay. have their own history and they will be misaligned from the stellar disk. So this is a special case you can say, and it happens usually in case of uh, gas equation. Otherwise, you will see the same alignment and. Uh, 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 by the way, do you can you also get uh, dispersion information using some stellar population? I suspect that uh, dwarf galaxies, uh, some of the stellar population can be distinguished, or is it not? Uh, yeah, so using PPS itself, uh, like massive star see. forming regions, uh, like uh, or uh, S2 knots. Uh, so, so sorry, I. It, those those, those, yeah, those kinematics would be more reliable than the, this gas and this stellar one. Mm -hmm. Sorry, um, can you please repeat your question again? Yeah, what, um, what, what I'm saying that, uh, I mean, dark galaxies might be uh, having apparent stellar population, like uh, massive star forming reasons. So uh, if there is a number is sufficient enough, let's say six, seven or more, Using that also, it is possible to estimate this dispersion information, kinematics. Oh, velocity dispersion. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so this is uh, integrated over certain region and uh, uh, I mean, like a spectral size, that is, uh, I mean, fiber, for example, manga is uh, IFU based, uh, uh, sorry, the fiber based IFU uh, uh, observation. So in one IFU, spectra, you will get some region of the galaxy. Within that, how the star, light, and gas are Okay, it may not be possible. Yeah, okay, I got it. Yeah, it may not be possible in this. And also, I had a question, like you showed one plot, where you said that the poor metal metallicity have uh, more prone to have S2 deficiency uh, uh, galaxies. Can you show that? Uh, 
Yeah, this one, uh, the next one. No, the next one. This, this one? previous one. No, no go to the previous where you showed the meta uh, some relation with the S2 deficiency with the metallicity. Oh, okay, okay. This one. Yeah, yeah, this one, this one. So mm -hmm. I, I could not actually get what you uh, you are trying to uh, conclude from the right plot. It's only metallicity, uh, which is indicating a deficiency, not any other factor. Is he, uh, for um, example, so mass mainly, of the galaxy okay, and other no. star formation histories? Uh, uh, okay, so point is that here to see if uh, the metallicity is playing any role or not. So thing is that this main plot is shown for correlation between S2 deficiency and the uh, Laman continuum escape fraction. But we see also if there is any pattern depending on the gas phase metallicity. So if there is any starburst galaxy, I should see there should be uh, there should have lower metallicity because gas secretion can dilute the gas metallicity what the galaxy had previously. So if there is a gas secretion, so that can so new fresh gas can dilute the previous gas which is available in the uh, galaxy. So here one can say that when the gas secretion happen and this galaxy start forming huge star formation. At that time, they were metal poor. Okay. So, like here, uh, which is galaxy which is more S2 deficient and showing the large escape fraction, they are metal poor. Where the star formation level is low, uh, I mean, uh, metallicity is uh, high, so there is a less S2 deficient, they have less uh, uh, escape fraction of Lyman country. So, that was the my point. Okay. So, okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Uh, any further questions, comments? Okay. Uh, so, Avisek, so uh, the fitting that you showed, the spectral fitting, uh, PPXF. Mm -hmm. So, uh, can you go to that slide again? Yes. So, I mean, uh, uh, could you reliably estimate the uh, stellar uh, kinematics parameters like uh, blue, I mean, the age or stellar velocity dispersion? Because uh, the spectra looks very noisy and uh, yes, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. B line, one B or in a D line, so not visible, it seems. Yeah, in case of uh, and this, uh, because uh, all information may get diluted because of a strong emission line, mm -hmm. and also the spectrum is noisy for extended days. But uh, whatever we could uh, have uh, with that, we just get this limited information. But uh, our strong point is that uh, with MG1 absorption feature, we are confirmed that there is a, a old stellar population, but we also tried with PPXA mm -hmm. and uh, with the certain uh, uncertainty, we are mm -hmm. matching with our MG1 uh, esti with, uh, estimate with um, MG1 and the PPXF. Uh, oh. So you are right, I mean, this is noisy, but uh, yeah. whatever we have, this is, would be the best one because uh -huh. this is a FE based spectrum, which is itself a long integration time around three hours. And also, we then again stack the all spectrum. Uh, so, this so is which, which, which telescope? Or? Extra that you got? This is manga. Okay, manga. So still, I mean, I cannot have better than this. Uh -huh. But now, I mean, more observation with bigger telescope for more object, we can clarify this point further. But okay. So, uh, so that, there are no Gemini GMOS spectra for this? Uh, no. Okay. 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 And uh, there's another. Um, image that you used uh, to decompose. Uh, so I-band image, this is I-band oh, image. Okay. So are you, are you getting some kind of observations of uh, host galaxy to uh, do this decompositions for other sources? Uh, so actually for other sources, if you see uh, this mm -hmm. diagram, they are uh, low mass and uh, either uh, and the green galaxy are there at high receipt. And if you see the typical image from the SDSS, 
so they are unresolved but uh, uh, still i have not planned for uh, bigger telescope uh, to uh, to observe this source with bigger telescope but mm. uh, uh, i think uh, if we have a good bigger telescope then we can resolve it and we can further clarify uh, all the point that is related with the issue that i discussed okay so, yeah. okay so इतना फूडी एक टॉक था ब्लूबेरी ग्रीन पीस खाना ही खाना था खाना देखिए इंटरेस्टिंग होता है और भी कुछ कचौरी वचौरी भी लाते तब तो चल जाता अच्छा लगता है and uh, yeah and thanks all the participants uh, for attending this and uh, avishek also uh, okay so with this we'll close for today and we'll meet again uh, next week so till then take care bye 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 bye